Why is it that when we're told not to do something, we immediately feel a compulsion to do it anyway? Why does something being prohibited make it more appealing? Why, of all the fruit, in all the trees, in all of paradise, why do we eat from the one tree we've been told we must not eat from? Chotomash. Why is forbidden fruit the sweetest? As long as there's been laws, there's been criminals. As long as there have been powers that be that give us rules to follow, tell us what we can and cannot do, where we can and cannot go, what we can and cannot consume, we've been disobeying them. A huge problem I always had with the myth of the Judeo-Christian God, specifically in the context of the Garden of Eden story, is the idea that goodness is grounded in obedience to an entirely arbitrary commands from an authority, while evil corresponds to disobedience. I never liked how this conception of good and evil is traditionally translated into the idea of love. According to the Christian, God determines what is right and wrong for us as an expression of how he loves us, how sweet of him, and us loving him back means we must obey him. Like a parent, the preachers say. Yes, this model of love equals obedience also informs much of our contemporary society's understanding of the dynamics between parents and children. Parents set the rules, and children must obey. Parents assume authority over their kids, and children must submit to their authority, lest they risk losing their parents' love and favor. What is the first commandment of parental authority, in its simplest terms? Almost everyone's heard it before, all of us know what it is, especially the parents in the audience. How are y'all doing? This video is gonna be a rough ride, so buckle up. Why can't I, because I'm the parent and I said so? What can a kid say to that? In the Garden of Eden story, there are actually two special trees. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of life. The fruit of the latter bestows eternal life, while the former bestows self-awareness. Something happened when we ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Our eyes were opened. We saw ourselves in relation to our environment for the first time. We learned how to make our own value judgments. We tasted enlightenment. Indeed, we responded to this by feeling shame, but that shame was our own, as was our decision to eat the fruit in the first goddamn place. And this is what was deemed punishable by our so-called benevolent divine parent figure who supposedly loved us. In the story as written in Genesis, God banishes us from the garden specifically so we cannot eat from the tree of life after having attained to the knowledge we were forbidden. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand, and take also the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden, to till the ground from whence he was taken. According to God, we could only have one or the other. An eternal life, spent in ignorance and subservience, or a short and dangerous life, but one wherein we have agency and power over ourselves. To forever be a slave in paradise, or to live free on earth, however briefly. This isn't the first time I've reinterpreted the myth of the Garden of Eden. See my video The Thin Pink Line on gender weirdness. Because it's a useful story. God isn't real outside of our own minds, but our minds are built to think in terms of narrative. And in this video, the narrative of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a vehicle for talking about, well, good and evil, as well as knowledge and power, and most importantly, the relationship between all these things. So what exactly was this knowledge? What did we learn about good and evil on that fateful day? What insight was so threatening to God's authority that he felt his only recourse was banishment? Why did a supposedly all-powerful God, he whose authority was higher than any other, why did he deem it necessary to keep us in the dark, to deny us self-consciousness? While I'm now a godless, depraved anarchist, I was raised very religiously, as a Christian, and these are the questions that plagued me in my early teen years, the time when we really start questioning conventional wisdom, the things our parents, church, culture, and society teach us is true. Values and virtues were expected to accept on faith and love. or more accurately, out of obedience. I didn't like this one bit. I was a defiant child. I had problems with authority. I did not like people telling me what to do. And the more I learned, the more I felt like I was seeing a different side of this divine parent figure I had known all my life. For the first time, I was seeing his ugliness, his conceit. His omnipotence began to make me feel powerless instead of protected. His immutability was revealed to be unchecked arrogance. His omniscience made me feel ignorant, like he wanted to keep me small, oblivious, and to not question him. But question him I did, and the answers I found to these questions revealed a truth that turned my whole world upside down and inside out. This God did not love me. He feared me. God did not want me to be happy or to understand the world around me. He wanted to control me. I'm an adult now and I don't believe in God anymore. I rejected slavery in heaven and chose freedom on earth instead. Unfortunately, denouncing God doesn't make him go away. Nietzsche ushered in modernity when he declared God dead, but that heavenly bastard's ghost still hangs over us like a dark cloud all the way to the present day. And in the same way that the divine authority of kings was supplanted by the equally abstract authority of capital and nation states in the 18th and 19th centuries, so too was the traditional concept of God and his power replaced by a modern, 
modern many-faced specter called moral law. But at the end of the day, that power and the institutions that wield it are one and the same as the God of Eden. Still today, our society is governed by forces that insist we stay ignorant and unconscious. To be good is to behave. We are promised life and abundant reward if we only obey. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil still stands. Its fruit is still ripe and it's still forbidden. And the powers that be, the forces responsible for all the suffering in this world, capitalism, war, poverty, homelessness, systemic inequality, climate change, white supremacy, transphobia, homophobia, all the phobias, fascism, injustice, everything that pits human being against human being, they still order us to not eat from the tree. It's because they are afraid just like God was afraid of us in Eden. Those in power are threatened by the things humankind is capable of when we obtain this knowledge and awareness. Truth is dangerous to them. So, my beautiful strangers, if there was a writer and philosopher who so thoroughly threatened and terrified the powers that be that they kept him imprisoned for three decades of his life and deliberately destroyed three quarters of his massive body of work, should he not be of interest to us? And when we consider that in spite of this writer's works being buried and suppressed by those with authority for over two centuries, his name and ideas are still echoed today by the most influential artistic, intellectual, and cultural figures of the 19th and 20th centuries, then it becomes critical for us to study this man and his ideas. So, come with me. We need to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We need to talk about the Marquis de Sade. Is it not incredible to think that in Sade, we have the most absolute writer who has ever lived, and yet for a century and a half, we have chosen to ignore him? And is not this choice voluntarily to ignore him on the grounds that his work and doctrine are too somber, too anarchistic, too blasphemous, too erotic? The charges vary with the censor. Both doubtful and dangerous? A choice on the side of darkness? Circle 1 on perverts and puritans. My manner of thinking, so you say, cannot be approved. Do you suppose I care? A poor fool indeed is he who adopts a manner of thinking for others. My manner of thinking stems straight from my considered reflections. It holds with my existence, with the way I am made. It is not in my power to alter it, and were it, I not do so. This manner of thinking you find fault with is my sole consolation in life. It alleviates all my sufferings in prison. It composes all my pleasures in the world outside. It is dearer to me than life itself. Not my manner of thinking, but the manner of thinking of others has been the source of my unhappiness. The reasoning man who scorns the prejudices of simpletons necessarily becomes the enemy of simpletons. He must expect as much and laugh at the inevitable. A traveler journeys along a fine road. It has been strewn with traps. He falls into one. Do you say it is the traveler's fault or that of the scoundrel who lays the traps? If then, as you tell me, they are willing to restore my liberty, if I am willing to pay for it by the sacrifices of my principles or to my taste, we may bid one another an eternal adieu. For rather than part with those, I would sacrifice a thousand lives and a thousand liberties if I had them. These principles and these tastes, I am their fanatic adherent, and fanaticism in me is the product of the persecutions I have endured from my tyrants. The longer they continue their vexations, the deeper they root my principles in my heart, and I openly declare that no one need ever talk to me of liberty. It is offered to me only in return for their destruction. Donation Alphonse Francois, the Marquis de Sade, was born in 1740 to an aristocratic French family. The first half of his life was characterized by multiple sexual scandals and years spent on the run from authorities before being locked away in 1777. Now, there's a lot to be said about the crimes Sade actually committed in his life, despite the actual historical records being suspiciously sparse and several accounts having questionable veracity. In a later section, we'll discuss the specifics of each case, but the important thing to take away from his criminal history is that the only things he was actually tried and punished for, the only acts that truly outraged society and earned him his scandalous reputation was not for his violence, but for his blasphemy and sodomy. During his first 13-year imprisonment, Saad began to write a lot. He produced some of his most notorious work during this time, including a dialogue between a priest and a dying man, the 120 Days of Sodom, Eugenie de Franville, and the first version of his magnum opus, Les Invertunes de la Vertu. 
or the misfortunes of virtue. Saad gained his freedom in 1790 amid the turbulence of the French Revolution, renouncing his nobility to become Citizen Saad, a revolutionary politician and public servant frequently at odds with France's changing regime. He was elected as a far-left delegate to the National Convention and published the second version of Les Infortunes de la Vertu in 1791, titled Justine, or Good Conduct Well Chastised. He was briefly imprisoned again on accusations of moderatism, narrowly avoiding being executed during the Reign of Terror in 1794. Upon his release, Saad spent several years in dire poverty, continuing to write his fiction, most notably Philosophy in the Bedroom in 1795, and finally the ten-volume final version of Justine, called La Nouvelle Justine, from 1797 to 1801. It was this massive literary diptych of two sisters, Justine and Juliet, that so enraged Napoleon that he had Saad imprisoned without trial in 1801, and the former Marquis spent the last 13 years of his life in an asylum, until his death in 1814. Following Saad's demise, a majority of his works were banned or destroyed, so he remained virtually unknown for a hundred years, until his work was rediscovered in the early 20th century. And while Saad himself remains obscure in the mainstream even today, the influence of his fiction and philosophy is inescapable. Neglected by the canon of Western philosophy to which he unquestioningly belongs, the Marquis de Saad was an Enlightenment philosopher, with contemporaries Voltaire, Diderot, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, David Hume, Immanuel Kant, and the inventor of capitalism, Adam Smith. He was also a revolutionary, concurrently with Robespierre, Jean-Paul Marat, Marquis de Lafayette, and American founding fathers like Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton. Saad's materialism, proto-existentialism, moral nihilism, and militant atheism predated those of notorious abyss gazer and horse boy Frederick Nietzsche by a century. It was Christianity, with its heartfelt resentment against life, that first made something unclean of sexuality. It threw filth on the origin, on the essential fact of our life. Let us remember that, despite the tasteless fables in the Holy Writ, Sodom and Gomorrah, for example, nature does not have two voices. She does not create the appetite for buggery, then prescribe its practice. This fallacious prescription is the work of those imbeciles who seem unable to view sex as anything but an instrumentality for the multiplication of their own imbecilic kind. But I put it to you thusly, would it not be unreasonable for nature, if she opposed buggery, to reward its practitioners with consummate pleasure at the very moment when they, by buggering, heap insults upon her natural order. Furthermore, if procreation were the primary purpose of sex, would woman be created capable of conceiving during only 16 to 18 hours of each month, and thus during only 4 to 6 years of her total lifespan? No child. Let us not ascribe to nature those prohibitions which we acquire through fear or prejudice. All things which are possible are natural. Let no one ever persuade you otherwise. Saad's theories on desire, human sexuality, and psychology likewise preceded the theories of the father of psychoanalysis and sexually repressed cokehead Sigmund Freud by over a century. Much of our highly valued cultural heritage has been acquired at the cost of sexuality. Sex is as important as eating or drinking, and we ought to allow the one appetite to be satisfied with as little restraint or false modesty as the other. Surrealism is fundamentally indebted to Saad. Guillaume Apollinaire, the French poet who coined the terms surrealism, cubism, and orphism, famously called the Marquis the freest spirit who ever lived. André Breton, the founder of surrealist thought and author of the first surrealist manifesto, read Saad. Surrealist filmmakers Louise Bunuel and Salvador Dali were inspired by Saad, as was the visual art of Man Ray, Eugène Delcroix, Edgar Degas, Francis Bacon, and Pablo Picasso. Saad's influence has been enormous in every sphere of modernist art. His aim was to destroy every illusion surrounding human sexuality, be it historical, moral, or religious, which inspired artists to look at the body in a new way. Philosophers Jacques Lacan, Jacques Derrida, Roland Barthes, and Michel Foucault all published studies on the Marquis, as did Pierre Klosowski, Max Horkheimer, and Theodore Adorno. Feminist writers Simone de Beauvoir, Susan Sontag, Angela Carter, and Camille Paglia wrote in his defense. Saad inspired poets like A.C. Swinburne, Paul Eluard, and Charles Baudelaire, credited by Marshall Berman as the first modernist. Hedonist musicians like Jim Morrison, From the Doors, and Marilyn Manson. Playwrights like Rachild, Peter Weiss, Doug Wright, and Yukio Mishima. And novelists like George Bataille, Franz Kafka, Fyodor Dostoevsky, Gustave Flaubert, and Robert fucking Bloch, the guy who gave us Alfred Hitchcock's seminal horror masterpiece, Psycho. Why, she wouldn't even harm a fly. 
actor and abuser Army Hammer said the Marquis would be his dream dinner guest. Famously queer and hedonistic Hollywood actress Tallulah Bankhead once referred to herself as the ill-begotten daughter of Medusa and the Marquis de Sade. Countless filmmakers have been inspired by Sade, whether they're paying homage to his famous heroines, as in Lars von Trier's Depression Trilogy and Julia de Cournau's Raw, or adapting his controversial novels like Pier Paolo Pasolini's Salo or The 120 Days of Sodom, or the exploitation films of Jesus Franco, or simply thematically permeating through their filmographies like David Lynch, David Cronenberg, Nagisa Oshima, Pedro Maldivar, and John Waters. The Marquis de Sade was incredibly important to me growing up. I went to Catholic school and they told me if I just shut up, I could read. So I read The 120 Days of Sodom, but they were so stupid they didn't know what I was reading and they would say, isn't it nice? John is reading. Grove Press really saved my life by putting that book out. It was originally banned by Napoleon. That's how long it's been causing trouble and smuggled out of jail on prison toilet paper. That sounds like something I would come up with, but it's really true. And then there's Night Terrors from 1993, a really shitty horror film directed by Texas Chainsaw Massacre director Toby Hooper, starring a Nightmare on Elm Street horror icon Robert Englund as the Marquis and his demented descendant. It's really bad. But our Marquis' most widely known contribution to modernity, though, is relegated to the questionable field of sexual pathology, as his infamous sexual proclivities made him the namesake for sadism, the pleasure taken in inflicting pain. Originally, sadism was coined in the clinical context of sexual sadism disorder, defined in the DSM-5 as the recurrent and intense sexual arousal from the physical or psychological suffering of another person as manifested by fantasies, urges, or behaviors. A formal diagnosis of this applies to sadistic activity carried out on non-consenting individuals in unsimulated distress. It lies in contrast to the consensual practice of sadomasochism, a subset of BDSM, various forms of, often but not necessarily, erotic activities involving role-playing, bondage, discipline, dominance and submission, and other related interpersonal dynamics. BDSM is an example of kink. And since it's that time of year, as a quick aside, my take on the inevitable discourse of, should kink be at pride? No, kink is not inherently sexual. But yes, kink is inherently queer. And no, there's nothing wrong with kink being at pride. Kink will be where goddamn good wants to be, and you liberal Puritan pussies can learn to live with it or fuck off. Now, I personally take much umbrage with sadism being named after Saad for multiple reasons. One, because of the disparity between the extreme sexual violence portrayed in his fiction, admittedly horrifying, cruel, and non-consensual acts, and his actual real-life sexual practices, which mostly involved hiring sex workers and agreeing to conditions and expectations beforehand. And two, by all accounts, Saad himself was much more of a masochist, one who gets off on having pain inflicted upon them. When he did flagellate the sex workers he hired, it was only to the end of having them flagellate him in return. Yeah, our Marquis was a total butt slut bottom. We'll talk more in depth about his unconventional but not really that uncommon sexual preferences later, but suffice to say, history has not been particularly charitable towards Saad and his sexuality. And his notoriety as a rampant and violent sexual predator is unearned. This becomes even more nuanced when we consider that the first formal definitions of both sadism and masochism come from the same source, German psychiatrist Richard von Kraft Ebbing's Encyclopedia on Sexual Pathology, The Psychopathia Sexualis, from 1886. The Psychopathia Sexualis is also whence we get the first formal definitions of both homosexuality and bisexuality. This isn't a coincidence. Keep that in mind. Where the hell is she going with this is a frequent response to my work, which you probably know if you've watched any of my long-form videos. Be they Bo Burnham, CinemaSins, Homestuck, or the Knives Out movies, I tend to use these disparate topics to ultimately lead into larger discussions on the present-day trials and challenges facing all of us who live and suffer under late-stage capitalism. These conversations are often very difficult ones to have, and the one I wish to ignite with the Marquis de Sade in his work might be my most controversial and upsetting one yet. And not only will we be talking about several taboo topics that will make the average viewer uncomfortable, but the critical context in which I want to situate the Marquis in the present day is inflammatory, scandalous, and potentially outright damning. I suspect many of you will not approve. But if it exists, we must examine it. This is a discussion we need to have. We need to eat the forbidden fruit and obtain the knowledge that those in power desperately do not want us to have. We can't ignore the thin pink historical threads connecting the life and legacy of the Marquis de Sade to the marginalization and persecution of queer and trans people in the 21st century. Yes, it's time to stop beating around the bush. Donation Alphonse Francois, the Marquis de Sade, was 100% unambiguously and undeniably queer. He was imprisoned for his queer sexual practices and condemned for the transgressive queerness of his radical ideas. Unfortunately, there's been a shocking lack of scholarship evaluating Saad's life, relationships, and philosophy in terms of queerness and in the context of LGBTQ plus history. And given the way history has traditionally regarded him as a debased monster, the queer and trans folks who prioritize respectability and assimilation over liberation might consider this a good thing. But fuck that. That's why I'm here. Fuck respectability and fuck assimilation. We're here for nuance and we're here for truth.
It is understandable that as a reaction against the scandalous silence, Saad's enthusiasts have hailed him as a prophetic genius. But this cult, founded like all cults on a misconception, by deifying the divine marquis, only betrays him. The critics who make of Saad neither villain nor idol, but a man and a writer, can be counted upon the fingers of one hand. Thanks to them, Saad has come back at last to earth among us. Donation to Saad was neither monster nor demigod, but rather a complex, brilliant, but flawed human being, a queer writer whose marginalization and relationships with power can help us make sense of the moral persecution queer and trans people are dealing with in the present day. The uncomfortable truth is that Saad is not only a queer historical figure, but one of the utmost importance, a subject of study we need to become familiar with. For not only does Saad have so much to teach us about ourselves, but he also holds the key to understanding the people in power who are currently engineering queer and trans genocide as we speak. Whether you like it or not, the Marquis de Sade was one of us, and the powers that condemned and imprisoned him are the same ones who persecute us today. The puritanical principles he wrote thousands of vitriolic pages in defiance of are the same ideological weapons wielded by our current oppressors. This massive coordinated campaign of legislative and societal violence against queer and trans people by conservatives and gender fascists is rooted in an inflammation of moral panic, of generalizing and disparaging us whole cloth as predators, groomers, and depraved subhuman monsters. And for many of you, whether you belong to the community or not, it may seem counterproductive, if not damaging, to analyze the Marquis de Sade in terms of queerness. After all, we're trying to convince those on the right that we aren't groomers and pedophiles and rapists, right? Isn't taking a historical figure commonly perceived as an abject monster and associating him with queerness just giving ourselves a bad name, or worse, validating our oppressor's slander? First of all, no. Trying to convince fascists of anything is a waste of time, especially when it comes to the humanity of the people they seek to eradicate. It's far too easy to appeal to both logic and observable fact to assert that the right is wrong about queer and trans people being the monsters they paint us as. It's as absurd as any other prejudice generalization of the sort. The idea that black people are predisposed to being criminals, that mentally ill and homeless people are predisposed to violence, that autistic people are inherently antisocial or emotionally illiterate, or that there's any sort of causal relationship between being Jewish and holding institutional power. Trying to argue against these stupid stereotypes with their advocates is pointless. These so-called debates are just sports. Wheels kept continuously spinning to make those debaters and those who platform them more money. To engage with them at all is to concede to them. Secondly, the fact that there are queer predators in the world. They do exist, and thus our discussions must account for them. Now, being queer or trans doesn't inherently make people predatory, of course, but it doesn't make us immune from it either. Our community is nebulous, vast, and encompassing, and we do have wickedness in our house, and that must be addressed. In fact, the thing that fundamentalists and fascists are reluctant to actually confront is that the most wicked and depraved queer sexual predators who prey upon the young and vulnerable are standing on their side of the line. For example, your children are exponentially more likely to be sexually abused by your priest than by the drag queens reading to them at story hour. Women are exponentially more likely to be assaulted in bathrooms by the balding politicians wearing floral print panties and jerking off the tranny porn behind their locked office doors than they are by the trans women those same hypocritical politicians persecute. And the most infamous and vocal gender fascist alive today is nothing but a pathetic, closeted coward, rotting away in her castle, writing shitty novels under a man's name, choking on her own internalized transphobia and obsession with girl dick. The ultimate objective of this essay is to strike back against the phenomenon of moral panic, to unpack and unravel the myth of morality that those who condemn and wish queer, trans, and gender non-conforming people dead have wielded against us. Remember the god in the garden who punished us for obtaining the knowledge of good and evil. That divine authority who evolved into the agnostic concept of moral law during the Enlightenment, not coincidentally, the time our marquee lived in and responded to. Moral law, or morality, is a system of right and wrong that always claims objectivity, despite conveniently only ever applying to those unlucky enough to be condemned by the rabid moralists. Conservatives, reactionaries, fundamentalists, fascists, puritans, they have always, in some form or another, claimed moral righteousness and asserted themselves as the arbiters of what is good and evil, what constitutes virtue and vice. They lay baseless claims to moral authority and declare that whatever falls inside the arbitrary lines they draw is lawful, while everything and everyone that falls beyond those lines is criminal, and therefore subject to unequivocal judgment and punishment. Take sodomy, for instance. Today, culturally if not always legally, sodomy refers to anal sex. To sodomize someone is to fuck them in the ass. And it's literally no less normal or commonplace than vaginal or oral sex, among queer and straight people alike. Not to mention, anal sex is the most frequent and highly regarded form of sexual intercourse in all of Saad's work. 
and life, for that matter. But for much of recorded history, sodomy was a blanket term for so-called sexual immorality, which was one of the most harshly punished crimes there were. Sodomy has referred to homosexual intercourse, anal sex, oral sex, prostitution, fornication, masturbation, and any sort of non-procreative sex, even if heterosexual. But sodomy also described practices like bestiality, pedophilia, rape, incest, all that good stuff. It was all just sexual immorality. Yeah, for most of Western history, legally speaking, having queer sex was considered as morally heinous as raping children and fucking sheep. Never forget that. When the Christians call our existence sinful, that is what they are implying. Every time. And the punishments for sodomy throughout history have been brutal and unyielding under both religious and secular law. It was used to justify burnings during the Inquisition and executions of every witch hunt from Salem to the Red and Lavender Scares. All the way to the present day, rape has historically been treated relatively leniently in contrast to the severely punished crime of sodomy. Oftentimes it was a capital offense and countless people were condemned to death for it, including our Marquis. Of all the legal offenses Sod was actually tried with, it was sodomy for which he was sentenced to die. He and his manservant slash boyfriend Latour fled the country and were burned in effigy in their absence in 1772. This is the world in which our unrepentant, salacious sodomite lived. This is the system of moral authority that kept him in prison for 32 years, against which he wrote thousands of pages of transgressive and blasphemous philosophy in defense of simply being who he was. And it is these same phantoms of morality and moral law that our enemies appeal to when they declare us degenerates. The same antiquated myths they use to characterize all queer and trans people as groomers and pedophiles. The same frenzies of moral panic they use to paint us as villains, monsters, and predators. Despite the the fact that we are the ones who the laws are being written to persecute. We are the ones being shot down in the spaces we dare to exist in. We are the ones being denied health care, employment, and housing. We are the targets. But you know what? This insidious moralism is not exclusive to one side of the political spectrum. Far too often, the left falls into the same trap of reactionary puritanism as those on the right. We grant legitimacy to the same concepts of moral authority that conservatives and traditionalists accept as unquestionable truth. We may disagree and quibble over the meanings and applications of law, justice, right and wrong, good and evil, but across the board, we still tacitly accept that these outdated oppressive laws of morality are valid and must be heeded on principle. This is a mistake, an error by arrogance. And even if we have liberated ourselves from the myth of morality, all of us have baggage from it. So, I urge you to not take anything in this video personally, but at least some of it will speak to you and you may feel like you're being attacked. As uncomfortable as they may be, please sit with these feelings. Be calm, chill out, and leave your defensiveness at the door. We're here to learn more about ourselves and each other, and hopefully by the end, we can walk away from this video having grown as people. But that's up to you. I address myself only to those persons capable of hearing me. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. The Marquis de Sade has a lot to teach us and challenge us with. But I'm not mincing my words, because the threat facing me and people like me is very real and very serious. People's lives are on the line, and I don't have time to coddle any egos or absolve any consciences. I'm coming after the dastardly Puritan occupying every one of our minds and hearts. And like a sexual sadist herself, I'm coming for blood. Circle two, praying in the house of Sod. The notion of God is the one fault I cannot forgive in man. The Marquis de Sade is a curious historical and creative figure, in that he is generally historically characterized by his sexuality. But this is only the most myopic and superficial way of looking at his life. This is the only authentic portrait of Saad we have, from when he was 19 years old. Yes, he was a snack, 100% wood. But he lived over half a century beyond this, and for most of his life, he was not a hedonist. He was a prisoner. Saad's radical ideas and the fiction he wrote with them, i.e. the heart of his historical legacy, these did not come from his pleasurable interactions and relationships with other human beings. They came from his isolation. The pleasure of the senses is always regulated in accordance with the imagination. Man can aspire to felicity only by serving all the whims of his imagination. For those of us who have been spiritually seduced by the Marquis in his writings, our intimacy and kinship with Saad is generally not as a libertine, one who relentlessly pursued his fervent desires, but as a prisoner whose pleasures were constantly denied him by a spiteful and self-righteous society. It was society that feared a man so free, it condemned him for half his adult life, and in doing so made of him a writer. If there is a disparity between the life and the writings, the society that immured him is to blame. Sud once noted in a letter to his wife that, had the authorities have any insight, they would not have locked him up to plot and daydream and make philosophical disquisitions as wild and vengeful and absolute as any ever formulated. They would have set him free and surrounded him with a harem on whom to feast. But societies don't cater to strange tastes. They condemn them. Thus, Saad became a writer. And once Saad really began to seriously write in his 40s, he didn't start with sex and violence. 
His earliest work written in prison is A Dialogue Between a Priest and a Dying Man from 1782. Entirely sexless in contrast to his following works, this dialogue is a short and simple conversation wherein a condemned prisoner destroys a priest with facts and logic. Who is there who can penetrate God's vast and infinite designs regarding man, and who can grasp all the makeup of the universal scheme? Anyone who simplifies matters, my friend. Anyone. Above all, who refrains from multiplying causes in order to confuse effects all the more? What need have you of a second difficulty when you are unable to resolve the first? And once it is possible that nature all alone have done what you attribute to your god, what must you go looking for someone to be her overlord? The cause and explanation of what you do not understand may perhaps be the simplest thing in the world. Perfect your physics and you will understand nature better. Refine your reason, banish your prejudices, and you will have no further need of your god. While Saad's work is best known for its explicit portrayals of sex, violence, and the combinations thereof, the definitive element permeating everything he wrote is the philosophical concept of atheism and all its most extreme implications. Specifically, atheistic materialism, which is, in short, the most radical form of materialism. The idea that all of existence, all reality, is the product of matter. All imagination, all emotion, everything we think of as immaterial, especially the soul, is a byproduct of the electricity pumping through the chemicals in our brains, combined with atheism, which is just the denial of the existence of an immaterial god or deity. There is no god. Nature sufficeth unto herself. In no wise does she need an author. And Assad was a more vocal, aggressive, and adamant atheist than any other philosopher of his time. Not only did he consider religion an utter blight on humanity, but to Assad, God was humankind's greatest enemy and hindrance. A majority of contemporary Enlightenment philosophers subscribed in one form or another to a soft theism called deism, the belief that God does exist, but does not interfere with the universe after creating it. The Watchmaker God. This was the age of reason's rationalist attempt to reconcile the idea of God with the idea of a nature governed by immutable scientific laws. The deist God was based in reason and natural law, as opposed to any existing religious authority's conception of a deity. However, our Marquis called out his deistic intellectual countrymen, Voltaire, Montesquieu, Montaigne, Robespierre, and Rousseau, as the boot-licking, ring-kissing cunts they were, and called for the utmost rejection and negation of God entirely. I have no more to say to you. There is no restoring the blind to the light. Softly, my friend, own that between the two. He who blindfolds himself must surely see less of the light than he who snatches the blindfold away from his eyes. You compose, you construct, you dream, you magnify and complicate. I sift, I simplify. You accumulate errors, pile one on top of the other. I combat them all. Which one of us is blind? Yeah, Donation to Saad fucking hated God, and he hated religion, none more so than Christianity. One of the many ways Saad preceded modern philosophy's most ardent atheist and anti-Christian thinker, Frederick Nietzsche, by a century. I condemn Christianity. I bring against the Christian church the most terrible of all accusations that an accuser has ever had in his mouth. It is, to me, the greatest of all imaginable corruptions. The Christian church has left nothing untouched by its depravity. It has turned every value into worthlessness, and every truth into a lie, and every integrity into baseness of soul. But who can be mistaken about the miracles wrought by our divine redeemer? He who sees in him anything else than the most vulgar of all tricksters and the most errant of all impostors. Now, despite what many would have you believe, in the 21st century, Christianity still has an iron grip on most of the world, both socioeconomically and ideologically. Christianity is by a wide margin the largest religious group on the planet, with around 2.382 billion adherents. That's 31.11% of the entire world's population. And 1.36 billion of those folks, 17.1% of world population, belong to the Catholic Church, the largest denomination of Christianity, which in modern terms, the terms of the prevailing order of global capitalism, is one of the wealthiest private corporations in history, holding an incalculable amount of private wealth, most of which is kept secret, definitely not taxed. And in terms of ideology, American neoliberal capitalism is directly built on the foundation of the colonialist, work hard till you die alone, Protestant ethic and Calvinism, its Puritan bastard child. And Christian ideology also lies at the heart of fascism as well. It's called Christofascism, and it's probably one of the most accurate ways of describing the structural hegemony of the Western world. But in spite of this, atheism on its own is not a marginalizing stance in today's world. Sorry, not sorry to the new atheist movement, and really to anyone who uses atheist to define any significant part of their personality. Y'all are boring, and you're not really challenging anything just by not believing in God. Grow the fuck up.
But back during the Enlightenment, atheism was an incredibly transgressive and fringe philosophical and political position, and Saad's militant atheism was ultimately the basis of his persecution by the powers that be. This is because rejecting the very existence of God necessarily meant rejecting the validity of divine authority, which was used to justify the power of monarchies and the church, and by extension, more implicitly, to legitimize the institutions of capital and private property. All deism ultimately amounted to was philosophers trying to find a way to dissolve the power of the crown and the church, but while keeping intact the colonialist system of control called the market, i.e. replacing one set of masters, kings and popes, with another, the wealthy, the landowners, the capitalists, those who control the means of production. We'll dive more into the particulars of Saad's unusually radical politics a bit later, but the important thing to take away from Saadia and atheism is how it shifts the overall focus of philosophical, political, and socioeconomic analysis to the matter of no one means to have all that power. power is the through line of Saad's entire philosophy, and it's how we need to frame our historical and literary analysis through not just this entire video, but also beyond, into our real lives. When I was young, the single most important thing an adult ever said to me was a simple truth that literally changed the course of my entire life, something my 23-year-old English and philosophy teacher said on the very first day of class, when I was freshly 15. Everything in our society is trying to control you. The world is and will always be striving to control the way you think, the way you feel, and the way you act. Ironically, this teacher was later fired for fucking a student, which I'm 100% sure would have been me if I hadn't been a boy at the time, but that doesn't make this maxim any less true. The point is, power. We must learn to approach our world as philosophers, or more practically, as critical thinkers, those who interrogate and challenge systems of power. In everything presented to us, we must incessantly seek to determine the answers to these questions. 1. Who or what has power over whom? 2. Where is power concentrated? Three, how is power exercised and enforced? Today, we're going to challenge many of our commonly held assumptions, things most of us tend to take for granted. For the duration of this essay, we must learn to think in terms of atheistic materialists, like our strange marquee. What does that mean? Well, it means rejecting God, of course, but also rejecting the systems of thought that divine authority and natural law legitimize. Most importantly, this thing we call morality, the very notions of good and evil. Remember, we're eating from the forbidden fruit. We are seeking the knowledge of good and evil, which means we need to step outside of that binary and question the very foundation it is built upon. The idea that some things are just inherently right or wrong? Yeah, you're gonna need to leave that at the door. Go ahead and keep it there. I'm not asking anyone to fully abandon their moral or ethical principles. We're just going to put them to the side for a couple hours, or however long this video winds up being. Right now, we are just asking questions and thinking about things. And there's never any crime in thinking critically. Anyone who says differently is trying to keep you ignorant in order to control you. And when this video is over, when we're done having this little discussion, guess what? Your moral principles, whatever ideas of right and wrong, good and evil that you hold sacred, they'll be right by the door right where you left them. When you leave here, you can take them with you and go on your merry way. But there's no room for that baggage in this house. God has no place in here. He's not allowed in, but he can wait outside. And if he really loves you, he won't mind waiting in the car for a little bit. I understand your trepidation though. Here I am, acting like a preacher, an authority on the truth, or at the very least, an arrogant and condescending smartass. Where the fuck do I get off demanding that you question your reality? The audacity, I should be ashamed of myself. Well, you're right. I'm no stranger to arrogance and pretentiousness, but I'm also no stranger to shame and humility. I don't want anyone to think that I think I'm better than anyone else, because I will be the first to tell you, I'm not. I am a dumb, narcissistic ape, even and especially when my narcissism gets the best of me and convinces me that I am better than everyone else, because that happens. My words are very strong because they come from a place of deep conviction, but please don't think these convictions came to me easily or painlessly. Saad is a lot to swallow so to speak. I've had two and a half years to wrestle and reckon with the forbidden knowledge he has to offer, and now I have an existential obligation to share what I found. But perhaps, in order to dispel any pretension or condescension on my part, I'm gonna get personal with y'all, and tell y'all how I first found and fell in love with the Marquis. Depravity is a preserve unto itself, in which nothing is lacking. It has its shepherd's huts and windmills, its streams and lakes. But the whole landscape is not so tranquil. There are wastelands, valleys belching sulfurous fumes, predators, dried up springs. This ample domain was designed by God. However strange the phenomena that occur there, they are intrinsic. 
the child takes the telescope provided and looks through it from the wrong end. A telescope used in the way prescribed by morality and convention shows only how small the lawn and flowers surrounding one's home are. The child feels secure and is content with the beauty of its small domain. It starts hoping that once grown up, it can enlarge lawns and flower beds. But one day, something happens that strikes the child without premonition. You discover that the telescope has been the wrong way around. And then, you suddenly perceive what you've never seen before. The flames of sulfurous fire in remote valleys. The savage animals in the wilderness with their fangs bared. You know then that your world is an endless one of infinite variety. My radicalization began when I was 15 years old, and I only became more and more of a defiant, godless anarchist from there. Ironically enough, I also spent the following decade trapped in a constant cycle of controlling and at many times super abusive romantic and sexual relationships. Instead of actually dealing with, processing, and healing from my trauma, I just kept distracting myself with people who didn't really make me happy, and several who made me deeply unhappy. But around the time I turned 25, I finally broke this cycle. I left all my abusers and was, for all intents and purposes, alone with myself for the first time in 10 years. This was in early 2020, the time me and everyone else seemed to have decided was the year we were going to really get our shit together, improve our lives, get better. Needless to say, for most of us, 2020 did not go according to plan, and the physical reality of quarantine emphasized and reinforced my psychological and social isolation. Y'all were there. You get it. I was unemployed, stuck inside, and spent a majority of my time getting high and falling through Wikipedia rabbit holes, reading about art, literature, history, mythology, all that fun stuff. I first tried to channel this obsessive, otherwise aimless research into creating a YouTube channel, but the world and my solitude within it got the better of me. Time started to feel differently. Somehow 2020 bled into 2021. I lost faith in myself and deleted my channel. And then when society did its goddamnedest to move along, return to the status quo, pretend that the pandemic is over and the uprisings never happened, I lost my faith in everyone else, too. In 2021, I was stir-crazy and suicidal. After quitting YouTube, I returned to writing screenplays and novellas, manically outpouring my trauma and neuroses and my ideas about the world into fiction. And my rabbit holes of research only got deeper, darker, and scarier. I read, saw, and learned so much about humankind, about our history, and the phantoms and horrors that emerged from my fucked up mind terrified me when they appeared in the pages of the fiction I was writing. Human imagination is powerful. We cannot control what emerges from its depths, and reading about our species' most despicable crimes and shocking tales inevitably results in increasingly malicious monsters materializing in the stories we write ourselves. And I am no exception. Predators creep through my stories and haunt my waking hours. They stare at me. They fill me with fear and shame. But then, I met a man. A man who, like me at the time, was locked away in isolation, his only solace in his writing, his fucked up imagination, and his unremitting hatred of the world and those who rule it. This is how I found Saad. And boy, oh boy, folks, he fucked me up. Now, I was far from innocent when I first met the Divine Marquis. I was a sexually promiscuous, out and proud, faggot turned slutty transsexual dyke who had uh, all the orgies and did all the drugs since I was 15 years old. In all fairness, I'm still that person today, sans the orgies, because now I'm old and tired and napping is more enjoyable than nutting. And I was also no stranger to controversial or problematic fiction. Vladimir Nabokov's novels Lolita and Otter Ardor are still two of my favorites ever. For those who don't know, Lolita is the one where the narrator is a pedophile and abducts and rapes his 12 year old stepdaughter, and Otter is the one where two siblings have a passionate romantic and sexual relationship from their early teens to their late 90s. They're two of the most beautifully written works in the English language. Both very horny, very taboo. Controversial. But Nabokov pulls it off because he's a masterful writer. Lolita is gorgeously written, but is clearly framed in a way that damns its despicable narrator and elicits sympathy for its titular victim. And surprisingly, is not very graphic at all, despite its subject matter. I mean, Otter Ardor, on the other hand, is very graphic and unapologetically favors and even romanticizes its incestuous couple, but also their relationship is an enthusiastically consensual one between equals, so loosen your grip on those pearls and get over yourselves. The point is, even the controversial, problematic things I've read and watched are easy enough to take in good faith, to remember that Depiction does not equal endorsement. But Saad is not Nabokov. Saad is different. He's not a conventionally skilled writer or storyteller, and he isn't interested in characters in the way most literary authors are. Rather, the Marquis was a fucker first and a philosopher second. Writing was not his first love. It was an obsession that he embraced when his preferred carnal pleasures were denied him, and he wrote with unrestrained fervor and fury. Now, Saad's writings are as explicit as they come, and they do come, hard and often, completely lacking in finesse or subtlety, a bullwhip and blunt hammer in contrast to Nabokov's chessboard and butterfly nets. 
There's no apparent need to read between the lines of Saad's fiction because all of his most notorious works are quite clear, straightforward lectures and philosophical dialogues. Interspersed with sex, violence, torture, and acts of inhumanity, all this philosophy seems to be earnestly trying to justify. Like, I understood Saad's bitterness and antipathy toward God, the church, and society. I had felt the same for years. I was already thoroughly jaded. I rejoiced watching the system buckle and catastrophically fail under the weight of the pandemic. I found hope in watching the world burn. And on an interpersonal level, I held so much bitterness towards the people who had hurt and abused me. I finally saw beneath the mask that they were all narcissistic shitheads and I was just a perfect victim because I was so kind and caring. I took great satisfaction in constantly policing my own thoughts and behaviors, assured that I would never be, I never could be a predator, abuser, or monster like them. <laughs> But in spite of all that, I still wanted desperately to believe that this world was still good, that humankind isn't as violent and stupid and savage as we seem to be. I wanted to believe that healing was possible, that one could actually be a good person, that I could be a good person. I wanted to do the right thing. But the Marquis wouldn't let me have any of that. I wanted to do the right thing, but here Saad was, using my own familiar anti-establishment anarchist reasonings to assert, very convincingly, that there is no right thing. Good, according to Saad, is a myth, while evil is an empirical rule of nature. And not only that, but Saad was calling me out and daring to claim that wickedness, cruelty, and selfishness is a good thing. As a victim of cruelty and abuse of others who wanted to heal and recover, Saad's ideas seemed to be the absolute last things I should have been focusing on. But I couldn't look away, no matter how hard I tried. So I was compelled to confront these demons in and around my mind, which meant facing them head-on and being philosophically torn asunder by that existential mystery that haunts and vexes the deist and anarchist alike. The problem of evil. This is what characterized Saad's fiction for me. His unblinking and uncompromising unraveling of the mystery of evil. La gente generalmente se detiene ante ciertos pensamientos. Su vida es una continua distracción de su propia perversión. Cuando piensas en cogerte a tu mamá, rápidamente buscas distraer a tu mente de esos pensamientos. La soledad, en cambio, te arrastra y te hace enfrentar tus chaquetas más oscuras. Y no pasa nada. Dejas de tener miedo de tus pensamientos más grotescos. Okay, I know I said earlier that I don't want to waste time being overly cautious, not mincing my words and shit, but guess what? Because I'm not trying to just preach to a choir here. I really do want to inspire viewers to truly think and challenge themselves in ways they may not have before. And that means prioritizing clarity and comprehension on my part. But I'll admit, I am asking y'all to think about things that a majority of us find really, really uncomfortable to think about. So, this is me holding y'all's hand and walking you through some cognitive and emotional thorns. Consider this little intermission a helpful little primer on talking and thinking about taboo, about that whose name we are taught we must not speak. So have you ever been on a bridge or at some sort of great height and looked down when suddenly something flashes through your mind, either as a thought, an image, a feeling, a voice, even a momentary inexplicable compulsion? Wouldn't it be fucked up if I jumped right now? Our brains are tanks of watery gray mush with faulty wires and ever glitching sparks of electricity running through them. And they're in a state of constant stimulation from the world around us. And that causes very strange things to spontaneously zoom through them. These are called intrusive thoughts. Intrusive thoughts vary in intensity and type, but we all have them. They aren't always clear words or fully formed ideas. For most folks, they're generally just thoughts, feelings, images, or fragments thereof. Basically, when our brains are presented with something, they instinctively respond. When something trips the wire, it sparks. I say, don't think about pink elephants. Our brains are the assholes who make us think about pink elephants, whether we like it or not. All human beings are reactionary like that. Existing is reacting. The world happens around us, and we feel things and think things in response to it. We can't help it. Our brains do what they want. It's just, it's how they work. It's very important to establish this. Having a momentary impulse to jump off a bridge doesn't mean you're suicidal. Having brief intrusive thoughts of unmotivated acts of violence doesn't mean you're a violent person. It just means your brain is an idiot and an asshole. But don't worry, because literally every single one of us has that in common. They are purely reactive neural responses to external stimuli. Intrusive thoughts don't make you weird, they make you human. And who's trying to say they aren't fucked up in the head a little? So when it comes to taboos, it's fairly understandable why we are so uncomfortable bringing them up as subjects of discussion. Mention the word incest, for example, and what do most of our asshole brains make us think about? 
we think about family, of course, which is just one step away from thinking about our family. Don't say that. Same with things like sex, cannibalism, pedophilia, rape, shitting and pissing, or religion and politics for that matter. Discussing these things is difficult because that means really thinking about them. And no one wants to do that. The problem is we live in a deeply reactionary and judgmental culture, and we've been taught that thinking about and imagining bad things makes you a bad person. And as someone who spent a long time in quarantine stewing alone in a putrid blend of twisted fiction and vile history, I can assure you, thinking about bad things does not make you a bad person. Again, that's just how our brains work. And as we all know, the fact of the matter is that these are topics we really need to talk about, because they happen. They're relevant. So let's not beat ourselves up, let's be judgment-free, acknowledge that all our brains are assholes, and what you think and feel does not define you. Only what you actually do can do that. Okay, you with me? Good. Now, let's talk about evil. Circle three, the most impure tales ever told. In the solitude of prison, Sade was the first man to give a rational expression to those uncontrollable desires, on the basis of which consciousness has based the social structure and the very image of man. Indeed, this book is the only one in which the mind of man is shown as it really is. Its language is that of the universe, which degrades gradually and systemically which tortures and destroys the totality of the beings which it presents. Nobody, unless he is totally deaf to it, can finish this book without feeling sick. The Marquis de Sade's most infamous work is The 120 Days of Sodom, which is pretty odd considering it's a sprawling and unfinished mess of a novel, and as far as Sade's philosophies go, The 120 Days is rather rudimentary and underdeveloped in comparison to his later work. Sade wrote the entire extant text, which consisted of a completed first chapter with only rough drafts and notes for the remainder, over 37 days in 1785 while imprisoned in the Bastille, forming one continuous 12 meter, 40 foot long scroll which he kept hidden in his cell's walls. Sade believed his beloved scroll lost after his cell was looted when the Bastille was stormed by revolutionaries on July 14, 1789. He had actually been transferred to Charenton Asylum 10 days previously for inciting a riot outside the Bastille by screaming to the gathered crowds that guards were murdering prisoners. Pretty based. No notes. However, the manuscript had been salvaged and remained unknown until it was published over a century later in 1904, and it has fascinated, repulsed, and engrossed audiences ever since. And despite how creatively unpolished and philosophically juvenile it is, the 120 Days of Sodom remains, arguably, per Sod's words, the most impure tale that has ever been told since the world began. At least until he wrote Juliet, but we'll get to her. Four wealthy and powerful libertines, which is an interesting word with multiple meanings and connotations, but we'll get there, gather in an utterly secluded castle for four months with a harem of kidnapped victims, mostly children between the ages of 12 and 15. These men, the duke, his brother, the bishop, a magistrate, and the president, are lawless and without religion, whom crime amused, and whose only interests lay in his passions, and had nothing to obey but the imperious decrees of his perfidious lusts. All four men are murderers and rapists. You know, they're priests and politicians. Duh. Accompanying these villains are four accomplices, Madames Duclos, Champville, Martin, and Degrange, experienced sex workers whose job is to tell stories about the most depraved episodes of their careers, to inspire the libertines to act out these stories with their victims. And their victims include eight studs chosen for their... big dicks. The libertines' daughters, all of whom have been chronically sexually abused by their fathers, of course, four hideously ugly middle-aged women, and 16 virgins between 12 and 15 years old. Eight boys and eight girls. Also because Saad was a very thorough, meticulous, and obsessive writer, he gave all these characters names, backstories, skills and stats, dick sizes. The detail is just ridiculous. Basically, Saad would have been an amazing dungeon master. In more ways than one. Consider your circumstances. Remember who you are and who we are. And let these reflections cause you to tremble and shudder with horror. You're beyond the borders of France, in the heart of an uninhabited forest, you are sealed in an impregnable citadel. No one in the world has the slightest idea where you are. You are beyond the reach of both your friends and your family. So as far as the world is concerned, you are already dead. Now, let's get something important out of the way. The 120 Days of Sodom is not pornography. It's not even erotica, really. The work of Sod and Mazak cannot be regarded as pornography. It merits the more exalted title of pornology because its erotic language cannot be reduced to the elementary functions of ordering 
and describing. This is not meant to titillate or arouse. This is critical to understanding not just this novel, but a majority of Saad's work. Our Marquis wrote with intent, and that intent was not writing shit for himself to jerk off to. I have imagined everything conceivable in this sort of thing, but I have certainly not done, and certainly never will, all that I have imagined. As far as Saad's personal sexual preferences go, he was actually a pretty simple guy. In terms of kink in the 21st century, I'd actually say he's on the tamer side. He loved anal sex, sodomy, above all else. Pay closest heed to this counsel. Ass fuck, my fair friends. Tis the only way to amuse yourselves and prosper. Remember that they who bar you this pleasure are moved by naught but idiotic prejudice, unless it be by basest jealousy. He was also really into reciprocal flagellation. No kind of sensation is keener or more active than that of pain. Its impressions are unmistakable. No one doubts nowadays that flagellation is extremely effective in restoring the vigor destroyed by the excesses of pleasure. Reciprocal as in he didn't beat sex workers because he derived pleasure from the act itself. He derived his pleasure from having that same violence inflicted upon him by them. The degradation which characterizes the state into which you plunge the libertine by punishing him pleases, amuses, and delights him. Deep down, he enjoys having gone so far as to deserve being treated in such a way. There's plenty to elaborate about Saad's actual sexuality and the scandal surrounding it, both of which were heavily queer, but we'll get to those. No, The 120 Days of Sodom is not a collection of Saad's own fetishes, but rather an attempt at cataloging all possible sexual fetishes, period. Saad belongs to his age. He too begins with analyzing and patient collecting. That giant catalog of perversions, the 120 Days of Sodom, was for a long time taken to be the summit and conclusion of his work. Not at all. It is the foundation of his work, and the breaking of ground for it. The novel is unfinished, but the concept plays out the rest of its structure. The 120 days, as you might infer, sticks to a set schedule. The Libertines plan to occupy the castle for four months, from November to February, 120 days. Every day, the Madams take turn telling five stories a day, and the Libertines reenact these stories, using their dehumanized victims as props and fetishes, in order to experience every sexual pleasure imaginable. It's fucked up sadistic psychosexual roleplay theater. Passion plays, if you will. The Marquis' total 120 days would have consisted of 600 stories, their passions sorted by month, escalating in violence and intensity. The simple passions, the complex passions, the criminal passions, and the murderous passions. Saad actually only finished the first month, the simple passions. The 120 days of Sodom was a literary effort by Saad to catalog human pleasures and sexuality. Ewan Bloch, the German psychiatrist and sexologist who first published the 120 days, compares it to Richard von Kraft Ebbing's 1886 Encyclopedia on Sexual Pathology, Psychopathia Sexualis, considering its thorough categorization of all manner of sexual fetishes as having scientific importance. The Marquis de Sade very much did belong to his age, the age of reason, the enlightenment, a time when scientists, philosophers, and other thinkers were trying to categorically define man. Indeed, for rigorousness, Sade outdoes any of the encyclopedists, who all fall more or less rapidly into dishonesty. Voltaire's version of man may explain how humankind came to invent the spade, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's the hayloft, Diderot's conversation, but ogres and inquisitions and wars, uh, replies Voltaire, those poor people were mad. We'll correct all that. That is what I call cheating, rejoins Saad. We set out to understand man, and before we have even begun, you are already trying to change him. Yeah, the 120 days of Sodom is super fucked up. That's the point. It's a thought experiment, a conceptual study on the evil that human beings can inflict upon each other when one has absolute power over another. We've all heard that power corrupts. Duh. But what does that actually mean? What does it really look like? What can power do when wielded to its utter extreme? What does it do to those who have it? What does it do to those who are subjugated by it? Salo is a film not only about power, but about what I call the anarchy of power. Nothing is more anarchic than power. Power does what it wants, and what it wants is totally arbitrary or dictated by its economic reasons which escape common logic. Salo, Pier Paolo Pasolini's adaptation of The 120 Days of Sodom, is one of the most infamous and disturbing films ever made. And a huge part of what makes it so uncomfortable is how the setting and political context is changed from pre-revolutionary 18th century France to the World War II-era Italian fascist state of Salo. Saad's timely Enlightenment-era loathing of the European aristocracy is seamlessly transposed onto Pasolini's 20th century anti-fascist hatred.
and even today, almost 50 years after Salo came out, the fascists are still the villains. They still hold power and are still committing unspeakable crimes against the powerless. Wealthy men and women in positions of power within the clergy, the political and legal systems, the economy, the aristocracy, they're still using their money and influence to sexually traffic and abuse children behind their fortified walls, free of any laws, justice, and any consequences. Well, for the most part. Epstein didn't kill himself. The premise of the 120 days of Sodom is fearsome to us because it's timeless and evergreen. Because the wholly human-made horrors it attempts to honestly explore, despite being conceived by human imagination, are far from imaginary. Priests and politicians, billionaires and business executives, the class of people who hold the greatest amount of societal power, are by and large violent sociopaths and or sexual predators. History has proven over and over and over and over again that this is the rule, not the exception. All these mighty libertines who live solely for pleasure are mighty only because they have eliminated in themselves all capacity for pleasure. Cruelty is nothing more than the negation of self, carried so far that it is transformed into a destructive explosion. Insensibility makes a tremor of the whole being, says Saad, and adds, the soul assumes a kind of apathy which is soon metamorphosed into pleasures a thousand times more exquisite than those which weakness and self-indulgence would procure for them. In the 120 days of Sodom, Saad asks us, why do the powerful exploit and harm the vulnerable and powerless? The absurdly simple answer, drawn from Saad's materialist philosophy where nature is negation and destruction, and pleasure is the only truly meaningful human pursuit, is intuitive but chilling, because they can. The most glorious crime which this poor world is capable of providing is a wretched nothing, which makes a libertine blush with shame. There is not one among them who is not overwhelmed with shame at the thought of how mediocre his crimes are, and all seek crimes superior to any of which man is capable in this world. Now, the Marquis did not get to finish this experimental novel, and as far as the narrative goes, it doesn't really have an ending beyond a predictable, well, everyone dies. But remember, the ending is the most important part of any story, because the ending determines the frame of that story's contents, themes, messages, etc. So to me, the most interesting thing about the 120 Days of Sodom is how artists and storytellers have completed this tale. The ending of Pasolini's Salo is both poignant and chilling. While the fascists are taking turns watching their victims being viciously massacred from a distance, recall the way those in power can watch the carnage they create from the safety of their ivory towers. For example, Barack Obama looking through the Oval Office window while his drones decimate thousands of brown people half a world away. Music plays and two of the guards, having witnessed and collaborated in all the previous atrocities, dance a waltz together. One asks the other about his romantic partner on the outside, commonly translated as his girlfriend, but the case has been made that he's actually implying a boyfriend instead. The English subtitles provided on most home releases specify that they are likely female. However, Italians have disputed the translated term girlfriend. What he supposedly says is el tuo ragazzo, which indicates boyfriend rather than la tuo ragazza which indicates girlfriend. This moment of humanity serves as a stark reminder that power is ultimately incapable of snuffing out our humanity. They ultimately cannot completely reduce us to disposable soulless objects. Avanti! Ridete! E tu? Perché non urli di gioia? Perché non applaudi? Perché non canti? Perché non ti sgalasci delle risate? Ah, non ridi? Beh, voi due! They will never be able to kill us all, and as long as we are alive, we can choose to love and we can choose to dance. Revolution without dancing is a revolution not worth having. Salo is a phenomenal, horrifying, and beautiful film. It's beautiful in the way Lolita the novel is. It's wonderfully crafted and conveys exactly what it's trying to say with striking efficacy. But I don't have much more to say on it. However, Style of the Substance has an amazing video on Salo. If you're interested, um, that's linked below. Highly recommend it. The 120 Days of Sodom makes another appearance at the end of L'Age d'Or, a 1930 surrealist film by Luis Buñuel and Salvador Dali. The bulk of the film follows this really horny couple trying desperately to fuck, but being constantly interrupted by the repressive values and interference of the church, the bourgeoisie, society, all that. Yeah, the fascists and Puritans hated this movie. But then at the end, there's a stark shift to the 120 days, showing the libertines at the end of their retreat, exiting the castle to rejoin society. This is the Duke, and you might notice he bears a certain resemblance to a pretty popular religious figure. 
Everyone in 1930 sure did. A crying woman flees the castle, but the bearded duke leads her back inside. We hear her scream, and then Jesus, I mean the duke, emerges alone, his beard gone. And in case the message was lost on anyone, there's a smash cut to a Christian cross on which hang the bloodied scalps of several women. And that's how it ends. Yeah, the fascists and Puritans really hated this movie. A right-wing group, the League of Patriots, attacked Lodge Door's premiere screening. They threw ink at the screen, assaulted people who confronted them, and destroyed several works of surrealist art in the cinema lobby. As always, remember, do not trust people who, in groups who are anti-art. They do not have anyone's best interests at heart. Point is, the 120 Days of Sodom has proved just as relevant in the modern world as it was when Sod first scribbled it out in his cell. And considering the way power has evolved and fascism has risen yet again in the 21st century, perhaps it's even more relevant today. If we ignore Sod's vision, we do so at our own risk. For to ignore Sod is to choose not to know part of ourselves. That invaluable part which lurks within each of us, and which, eluding the light of reason, can, we have learned in this century, establish absolute evil as a rule of conduct and threaten to destroy the world. Though his words speak for themselves and need no apology, they will also serve to remind us, in an age which legislates billions to construct bigger and better doomsday machines, bombs that can wipe out entire populations and missiles to deliver them with incredible swiftness and unerring aim, of the absolute evil of which man is capable. Surely, if we can accept to live with the daily specter of the absolute bomb, we can accept as well to live with the works of this possessed and exceptional man, who may be able to teach us a trifle more about ourselves. The Marquis de Sade's writing and storytelling style is excessive, dramatic, redundant, hyperbolic, and most strangely filled with the darkest and driest humor. We'll build up to explaining that because it's hard to describe what makes Sod's work so funny. But in spite of all this, the 120 Days of Sodom is potent and powerful because of how ruthlessly it reflects reality and speaks to truth. Yes, this kind of art is difficult to confront. It's vexing to our sensibilities. We don't like thinking about children being sexually assaulted, tortured, forced to literally eat shit. I certainly didn't. In fact, confession time, I did not finish reading this novel. And not just because it's over 500 goddamn pages long and I have ADHD in the middle of a national Adderall shortage. I was just so disgusted, I had to nope out and watch Sallow instead. Which wasn't much better, but at least it was like two hours as opposed to 500 pages. Gaspar Noah, director of harrowing films also infamously difficult to watch, such as Enter the Void, Irreversible, Love, and Climax, explained his decision to include Sallow in his sight and sound top 10 greatest films poll picks. Salo is the film that my mother considered essential to take me to see on the eve of my 18th birthday. I was old enough to learn the torture and the reptilian nature of human relationships. To this day, I continue to consider it as the most educational film about man's domination by man. Yes, haha. Ha. It's hilarious that Noah's mother took him to see such a racy movie when he was so young. Ha ha he he ho ho chuckle chuckle guffaw. But honestly, I think his mom was right to do so. I think Sallow or The 120 Days of Sodom is a film that one should first watch as a teenager. No, I don't think it's inappropriate for kids that young to see. I'm definitely in the minority of people who think this, but overall, I think we are much too restrictive with the things we will allow and not allow young people to read and watch specifically regarding sexual content and cultural taboos. When I hear someone say, oh, I watched such and such way too early, or I saw this or that when I was way too young, I think, were you really too young, or did you not have someone older and smarter than you to explain what it was you were seeing? Honestly, in my humble opinion, if you consumed a piece of media as a child that impacted you in such a way that you recognized was fucked up and inappropriate for you to see, I don't think you encountered it too early. You encountered it right when you needed to. What young people lack is media literacy. They do not understand the context of challenging media. And this media illiteracy is an us problem. We're the adults, and young people need us to teach them how to understand transgressive art and the things it communicates. They need us to explain the social and cultural context that illuminates what media is trying to say or accomplish. The problem isn't children being too young to understand things. The problem of ignorance is not on them, it's on us. And the troublesome fact is, our society does not equip us with the tools to responsibly teach young people about fucked up and uncomfortable media. Yeah, it's super uncomfortable to have to talk with your children frankly about things like sexual violence, or talk about sexuality with them at all. It's uncomfortable, but you know what? If you're a child's parent or guardian or caretaker, that's your fucking job. Cuz, guess what? Your kids are gonna see this messed up shit whether you like it or not. Innocence is a myth, and trying to preserve it is as foolish a task as trying to stop a child from aging. We all live in the same world, a world filled with wonders and horrors alike, and you cannot stop your children from encountering and experiencing them. 
The abuses of power and evil contained in this book are very, very real. And coming from someone who, like most precocious millennial bookworms, read a lot of messed up books at a young age, we'll be so much better to the next generation by not being afraid of works like The 120 Days of Sodom and instead encouraging people to learn and understand what they mean than we ever will by hiding, banning, burying, or burning them. Remember, fascists are the ones who burn books. Ignorance only ever benefits those in power. You want kids to be better equipped to face a world that does not have their best interests at heart? Here, you saw to teach them. By now, I've probably alienated a lot of the parents watching. Sorry, parents. Remember, let's try not to take things personally. And if that is how you're feeling, tough enough, because we're only just getting started. Saad is unique in the world of perversion. Of course, he continues to fascinate and titillate because he evokes the dark forces in us that we constantly suppress. He is not a fascist, as has been suggested, nor is he a pornographer, but a man who gave unbridled reign to the dark side that exists in us all. This is a man who spent over 30 years of his life in prison, not because he was a killer, but because they didn't know what to do with him. He died in a madhouse. He was a libertine, and his writings must be seen separately from his life, not confused with it. An atheist who revered individual freedom, he belonged to the Enlightenment, but to what I call the dark or obscure enlightenment. Where does perversion begin and who are the perverts? What then should we do with writers like Saad, Mishima, Pasolini, Hitchcock, and scores of others who produce works of extreme refinement? What would we do if we were unable to evacuate our own dark desires through those who commit unspeakable acts? Whether perverts are sublime when they turn to art, or mystic creation, or abject when they give in to their murderous compulsions, they remain a part of us, of our humanity, because they flaunt that which we all try to hide, our own negativity, the dark side of ourselves. Hi everyone, how are things going? I wanted to slip out of character and take a quick little break so we can gather ourselves, catch our breath, and get some perspective. Remember, we're just talking about stuff. I'm just a pretty face on a screen saying words that ultimately cannot hurt you. Unless you let them, of course. But we're all adults here, right? I also want to take a few moments to talk to y'all about this video's sponsor. We need to talk about the Marquis de Sade, part one, is brought to you by the kind generosity of several strangers who give me money each month to make this bullshit. No VPNs, no shady online therapy apps and food services that sell your data, no streaming services, be they curated Criterion Channel variants or time-wasting learning communities that charge you to learn shit you can easily learn for free on YouTube, no cereal boxes three times more expensive than retail and packaged with more empty air than fucking potato chip bags, and definitely no shitty generic games for you to get addicted to and fritter away your time, attention, and money on. Raid Shadow Legends is slot machines for your phone, just so you know. I'm not a part of Curiosity Stream's Nebula Creator Collection, because they already have plenty of hot white trans women. Although for real, whenever y'all are ready for a radical tranny creating subversive content that actually challenges convention and the status quo, feel free to call me. I'm not all cynicism though. If any of those mattress merchants or sex toy suppliers want to sponsor me, I am as much of a whore as anyone else on this platform, so I will sell the fuck out of whatever you're pushing if it gets me some free product. Because I actually do kind of need a new mattress and vibrator. So yeah, call me. But in all seriousness, my videos aren't the kind of content that will ever be profitable under capitalism. Turns out, there's no real money in keeping it real. While I've spent almost two years working on this project, guess what, I'm not even fucking done yet, it's not advertiser or algorithm friendly, and as I write and record this, I'm perfectly aware that these videos will not do well. Like, at all. Now it really sucks because these are the things I have to say. These are the things I must share. The messages I feel I need to put out into the world. I need this. I need to do this to survive. And I just don't, and I don't just mean that in a material, economic way but an existential one as well. Choosing to do this thankless, difficult job is to sell your body, life, and soul. Outside of this... I have nothing. Believe me, I have a very sad and empty life. The remaining friends I do have, I only have because I met them through YouTube. Otherwise, I don't really have anything. Now, I'm not telling you this so you'll pity me. I don't want anyone's pity, and not just because it makes me feel pathetic and hate myself, but more importantly, I can't feed myself or pay my rent with your pity. So keep it to yourself. I'm telling you this because I need you to understand that I can't do this on my own. I am at your mercy. I am in your power, not the other way around. If this is the kind of content you want to see more of in the world, 
then that's up to you. It's your money, your attention, and if you have any sort of sizable platform yourself, your willingness to speak up for and support creators like me that results in these kind of videos existing at all. This isn't meant to elicit your pity. It's meant to make y'all understand, as my audience, that none of this is possible without you. I know I probably come off as an obnoxious, foul-mouthed, irreverent cunt most of the time, and like, to be fair, I kind of am an obnoxious, irreverent cunt, but this is all to convince y'all that I am sincere. When I say that I am indescribably grateful for y'all's willingness to indulge me, and some even to give me material financial support, I want you to know how much I mean it. Believe it or not, talking and acting like this to an audience from a place of genuinely caring, this is vulnerability. This is me being vulnerable. When I say thank you, all of you, from the very bottom of my heart, I want it to have weight. When I say, this video is brought to you by viewers like you, I want you to understand what that really means and how important your support is to me. So really, thank you for watching. I mean it. Sorry to pivot and get all serious like that, but I, I figure y'all have come to expect that from me. And <laughs> to be real, this essay is not getting any less personal, vulnerable, or serious from here. So I may as well keep y'all informed on where I'm at as we wade through these very difficult subjects. I'm gonna end this intermission by reading off the names of the 32 angels from my Patreon who made this video possible at all. Serafina Goodnight, Jane Brown, Elaine Fuentes, Ali Vitekis, Angelique Crothals, Christopher Garcia, Craig and David, Erie359, TB Skyen, Drexel, Dorinda Toner, Eva Parpar, Frank McManus, Luminbos, Naomi, Nat, Nobody, Pope, Shingo, Cinnabel, Susan Strong, Alexander Suarez, Emily Neaters, Evan DeFilippo, Fire Mermaid, George, Jamie Chambers, Leo, Nathan Shepard, Rochelle, Ray Fuey, Rebecca Williams, The New Poet Lawyerette, Helena, John Baranello, Serafina. Circle Four. Am I a libertine, or my 120 days of quarantine? Battle not with monsters, lest ye become a monster. And if you gaze into the abyss, the abyss gazes also into you. It's far too easy to write off Saad's perverse fiction as a record of his own kinky fantasies, as many have done. After all, if an artist creates something that makes us uncomfortable, how eagerly do many of us chalk it up to, well, they obviously made this problematic work because they have a fetish for it, or whatever. How many folks read about the subject matter of Lolita and justify that novel's existence by assuming Nabokov himself was a pedophile? Or assuming that any of the countless male directors whose films prominently feature violence against women, like David Lynch, Quentin Tarantino, Lars von Trier, or Wes Craven, are misogynists? I'll confess, I'm not immune to this reactionary defensive instinct. It's why I despise Paul Verhoeven and his films. But that doesn't mean that it isn't a mistake, or a lazy, frankly cowardly excuse for us to not have to look closer and actually think about why Saad, or anyone for that matter, might have written about these terrible things. Now, I do understand. Really, I do. It's a fair thing to wonder. Why, oh why, would someone want to write something like the 120 Days of Sodom? It certainly vexed and haunted me when I first encountered it. But what troubled me even more was the more important question of, what does it say about me that I can't get this man's fiction out of my head? Was Saad a bad person for writing it, I wondered, or am I the bad person for being so intrigued by it? Again, please don't think I had an easy time coming to the conclusions I'm trying to present in this video. I did not. And even less easy is the public presentation itself. No writer or philosopher has ever challenged me like Donation to Saad, and reconciling the truths I found in his work with the truths my own life experience has revealed to me was very, very hard. I resisted even trying to understand it for a long time, but my own principles made Saad's impossible to ignore. I realized that my confusion and torment over Saad's philosophy was embodied in a single word, the one he used to describe his despicable hedonistic characters, the same one used by society to describe and condemn the man himself. Libertine is an uncomfortable word for me, as is its etymological relative, liberty. Yes, the root of these words is the Latin liber, which means free, and according to its plainest dictionary definition, liberty is thus synonymous with freedom. And freedom's a great thing, right? Well. And maybe this is just because I'm an American and there's literally no word we love to parrot over and over without actually the faintest clue of what it actually means, like liberty. 
But contrary to the rhetoric, no, this is not a free country in any concrete sense of the word. Here we have both liberals and libertarians. Liberalism is what the American mainstream today thinks of as the left, the opposite of conservatism and the right. But as anyone who actually understands how US politics work, liberal Democrats are just as conservative as right-wing Republicans. And over on the actual left, calling someone a liberal is an insult, rightly so. And American libertarianism is an incoherent and inconsistent political ideology whose ambiguity allows it to be invoked by those on the left and right to boldly declare government bad. Y'all might be onto something there. Fucking groundbreaking. But the word and concept of libertine has been around for longer than the United States has. Hell, it's even older than the Marquis himself. So what does it actually mean? By the dictionary, a libertine is a person devoid of most moral principles, a sense of responsibility, or sexual restraints, which they see as unnecessary or undesirable, and is especially someone who ignores or even spurns accepted morals and forms of behavior observed by the larger society. Okay. Not a bad definition. Lots to like here. And ironically enough, the word libertine was originally coined by John Calvin, the guy during the Protestant Reformation who came up with Calvinism, as a disparaging term for his religious and political opponents. Interestingly, the term Puritan has actually had a similar linguistic evolution as libertine, first being a disparaging term for several different kinds of Protestant reformists before more specifically being applied to the New England Puritans of Salem witch trials fame, who were, in fact, Calvinists. And fuck those guys. So yeah, I'm pretty on board with libertines thus far. In comparison to Puritanism, cheekily defined by satirist and journalist H.L. Mencken as Puritanism is the haunting fear that someone, somewhere, may be happy. But during the 18th and 19th centuries, libertinism became a philosophy associated more with debauchery and hedonism. And if we look at the list of notable libertines on Wikipedia, we'll find quite a colorful roster. We have kings and cult leaders, including Caligula, Aleister Crowley, and Anton LaVey, actors and musicians like Charlie Sheen, Marilyn Manson, and Jim Morrison, poets like Lord Byron, Charles Baudelaire, and Arthur Rimbaud, and figures like Casanova and Don Juan, all of whom are kinda... not the company I want to be associated with. <laughs> like. Elagabalus will always be my queen, and I love the decadent poets, but they weren't necessarily the most stand-up guys. And there's even a lot to like about Satanism, but Anton LaVey's particular brand of Satanism is actually based on Ayn Rand's objectivism, and any philosophical proximity to that bitch automatically sends anyone's credibility out the window. And of course, the contemporary wisdom today, at least on the internet, is that identifying as a libertine is basically a dog whistle for someone who wants to fuck minors. Which, yeah, there's a lot of reasons to not want to be associated with the libertines in the above list, and that's one of the big ones for me. Now, it should be no surprise to anyone who's seen any of my previous work, but I generally detest the philosophy of individualism. It's an impractical and unrealistic way of thinking about an inextricably interconnected world. I think despite how useful it might have been in the past at challenging power and authority, as an ideology, extreme individualism has since overall made the world a significantly worse place than it could be. <laughs> Wait, Vivian, how can that be? Aren't you an anarchist? Doesn't the philosophy of anarchism begin and end with freedom and liberation? How can you be an anarchist but also oppose individualism? Well, hypothetical dissenter, you're actually right. This is something that legitimately vexed me and still does to some degree. Because ultimately, I believe that people should just do what they want. There's nothing inherently wrong with people just doing what makes them feel good, what feels right to them, right? One of the foundations of anarchy is the proposition that human society would be better if everyone just does what they want and lives however they want to live. To quote another anarchist named V, the world we're fighting for is the land of do as you please. This is the world I wanted to bring into existence ever since I was a precocious teenager. But then I met Saad and he introduced me to the libertines he wrote. And these Sadean heroes, for they are often referred to by scholars and sometimes Saad himself as heroes, they complicated the entire foundation of anarchy as I understood it. As an anarchist in the land of do as you please, what philosophical protest can I possibly raise against Saad's foul and vomitous villains, these libertines who derive their pleasure solely through dehumanizing, torturing, raping, and killing the young and vulnerable? I don't find pleasure in acts like rape and murder, but what about the people who do? Because those people do indeed exist. And according to my own principles, I cannot ignore or dismiss them. And the scary thing is, the Marquis' characters, while repulsive, are very compelling. The things they do revolt me to my core, but their verbose and seemingly counterintuitive justifications for their desires are somewhat logical, and they do make sense to me. Like, their libertine arguments for defending their right to rape and murder children, and my anarchist arguments for why we should abolish all rulers, reject all authority, and dismantle all hierarchies, 
these arguments begin from much the same place. And that's something that still fucking terrifies me. It's terrified me throughout the entire two years I've been trying to write this video, because it means putting myself out here, on camera, for posterity, and confessing that my mind led me through some dark and depraved places through quarantine. My efforts to figure out who I really am and who I want to be led me to deconstructing not just my own desires, but the fickle and anarchic nature of desire itself. My struggle to fathom the pathology of the people who had hurt and abused me led me to question everything I thought I had known about humanity, both in myself and others. My longing to understand why human beings do both the benevolent and malicious things we do to each other, to foster radical compassion for all humankind, it forced me to empathize with people I did not want to empathize with. The Marquis de Sade's treatment of the Libertines in the 120 Days of Sodom is complex and contradictory. He implores his friendly readers not to be frightened or disgusted by the unique passions contained within, but at the same time continuously warns us about the horrors ahead and pleads with us to continue at our own risk. Sade's sophistries will glorify the four Libertines as free-thinking heroes and then vilify them as wicked monsters, oftentimes in the same passage. As I mentioned with writers like Vladimir Nabokov, it's one thing to write about horrific characters while unambiguously framing their actions as evil, but what Saad does with the villainous characters not only in the 120 Days of Sodom, but throughout his whole body of work, it's a bit trickier. Saad is no moralist, and in fact might be better called an anti-moralist. He does not clearly and unilaterally condemn the actions of his fictional libertines as immoral or evil, and if he does, these characters usually then embrace their villainy and declare that, yes, they are evil, but if their nature moves them to do such things, then the greater evil would be to deny themselves these so-called wicked desires. Now, the actual moral philosophy contained in Saad's work is not a simple one, and it thrives in contradictions. Our Marquis preceded Hegel as a master of the dialectic, which is, in short, the process of determining truth by the reconciliation of contradicting ideas. We'll get into the finer points of Saad's dialectical negationist philosophy later, but for now, it's critical to understand that despite how straightforward as he may read, Saad is not to be taken at face value. And the truth is, while we are arguably better today than we were in Saad's time, the society we live in is still a fiercely puritanical and judgmental one. And the medium through which I'm trying to share these transgressive ideas is the internet, a more polarizing and reactionary forum than any other in human history. Frankly, the internet and the people on it scare me. Yes, you, you all scare me. Participating in discourse on the internet is necessarily performative, and when it comes to publicly expressing our opinions and feelings on anything potentially problematic, convention demands we must affirm our own quality of character with vehement displays of moral outrage and condemnation. Basically, our moralism leaves no room for nuance, complexity, or compassion in our conversations. When people hear that Lolita is a book in which pedophilic abuse occurs, online convention dictates we must not only regard the novel as unilaterally bad, but do so by openly expressing our condemnation of it, by making a convincing show of it to please the anonymous masses. Because if we don't let everyone know where we stand, then advocating for Lolita and the 120 Days of Sodom as useful and enlightening books basically means that we're child predators and rapists, right? Or so goes the logic of the online moralist, as well as every Puritan who seeks to ban books they find even slightly morally questionable. And again, having discussions like the ones I'm trying to have in this video are especially dangerous to do as a queer and trans person. Because our enemies are out there, salivating over their keyboards, chomping at the fucking bit, looking for any excuse to paint me as one of the monsters they accuse us of being. I've been trying to accept the reality of my situation for, well, as long as I've wanted to make this video on Saad, his life, his work, and his relevance to the here and now. I've known that there will be many who will use this essay to call me a pedophile, a groomer, a rapist, an apologist thereof, or any number of vile and hideous accusations. I know how this works, especially as a queer trans woman in the public eye. And, even more contentiously, I'm one with a clear and uncompromising agenda. I aim to accomplish something that people on the internet, all across the political spectrum, including in the queer and trans communities themselves, really do not like. Having their views, ideas, assumptions, feelings, and opinions challenged. Yeah, I want to challenge y'all in the same way that Saad challenged me. But God help the poor fool who implores people on the internet to self-reflect and risk thinking about bad things or ask dangerous questions because we've been inculcated with reactionary moral reflexes that teach us that doing so makes us bad or dangerous people. But I need you to take this to heart. These reflexes are rooted in a lie. A myth meant to control the way we think and feel. To limit our ability to investigate and understand our world better. In order to keep us powerless and afraid. Now, I, I do want to clarify, I haven't actually done anything morally reprehensible. I've done nothing I'm ashamed of, and I've caused no one any harm, at least as well as a white American woman living under capitalism can. But despite my better angels and best intentions, the depravity and evil contained in Saad's work did inspire my imagination. And not just my own fiction. My fucked up intrusive thoughts reached a new level of violent and foul and cruel after emotionally opening myself up to the things I was reading. But after enough time alone, I discovered something interesting. 
that Nietzsche was wrong. I confronted monsters without becoming one myself. I spent enough time gazing into that abyss that my eyes adjusted to the dark. The horrible things that the Marquis de Sade's work conjured in my brain were merely phantoms. They could disturb me, make me uncomfortable, but they could not harm me. And much more importantly, they could not harm anyone else, not unless I allowed them to. I'm not afraid of human beings anymore, because I understand them in ways that I didn't before I found Sod. And that's fucking saying something, because I live in the 21st century, a time filled with horrors beyond Sod's wildest imaginings. Yeah, the guy who wrote the 120 Days of Sodom would be nauseated and traumatized by the shit we saw on the internet when we were literal children. Remember that. Keep it in mind. It's useful for perspective. Like so many others, good and bad people alike, I found myself in Donation to Sod, a man who was locked away for unapologetically pursuing that which gave him pleasure. His commitment to his so-called unusual tastes, in defiance of his society's moral authority, condemned him as a libertine, a label used to justify his imprisonment and dehumanization. And you know what? Sod's inhumane treatment by the powers of the 18th century vividly recalled for me the way I and people like me are treated by the powers that be today. The way I practice and perform gender is condemned by the prevailing order as unnatural and immoral, and by extension, every aspect of my sexuality is policed and framed as perversion or predation. I'm a queer trans woman, and I like to fuck other women. If I'm validated as an actual woman, then I'm condemned by the homophobes as a dyke. If I'm considered a man pretending to be a woman, as believed by TERFs like JK Rowling, then wanting to fuck real women makes me a predator and a rapist. And to those same gender fascists to whom trans women are actually men, then whether I'm having straight sex with men or having lesbian sex with other trans women, I'm condemned as a faggot either way. My very existence is considered criminal, a defiance against both God and nature. My desires, over which I have no control, they damn me in the eyes of the society I live in. And if skeptics want to protest by insisting that, save for a vocally hateful minority, queerness and transness are tolerated by the mainstream today, let me tell you what tolerance actually means. Society tolerating us just means that they're gracious enough to not explicitly call for our elimination. Tolerance means that we're allowed to exist, but only on their terms. Tolerance implies that, given the choice, they'd prefer it if we just weren't around. As mentioned, I grew up trapped in the indoctrination of Christianity, the exact same goddamn institution that raised Sod over 200 years ago. And something I always heard adults say with regard to queer people was, hate the sin, love the sinner. And to all the Christians who regurgitate this platitude from the bottom of my heart, sincerely, fuck you. Hate the sin, love the sinner is what tolerance means. It means that if they had the option, they would do anything they could to change queer and trans people into something more acceptable to them, while claiming to love and accept us at the same time they're desperately praying for us to not be what we want to be, to not do what makes us happy. And guess what? They do believe they have the option to change us, and God fucking willing, they are doing everything they possibly can to accomplish this now. And the most immediate victims of this insidious agenda of control and manipulation? Oh, you know who. I know you know. They can't stop talking about them. The most vulnerable, the most powerless in our society. The young. The powers that be, not just in the United States, but across this entire so-called civilized and tolerant world, are desperately trying to make it impossible for young people to exercise agency over their gender identities and expressions. They do this by appealing to what our society has taught us all to believe that love and tolerance means. To love your children, they say, means to dominate and dehumanize them, justifying it as protecting them. The powers that be justify this need for protecting the children by stoking our fears, capitalizing on our alienation from other human beings, and inflaming moral panic against queer and trans adults, all of whom were once children ourselves, but are now considered lost. I have some news for all the parents out there. Your children are just as queer and trans as your peers are. And despite what society may have deceived you into thinking, you cannot change that. They call people like me groomers because your children can see us and recognize themselves. They see in us what they want to be. We don't make your kids queer. We don't make them trans. All we do, all we have ever wanted to do, is exist. To be ourselves. And whether you like it or not, by simply existing, we show your children what is possible for themselves. Because that's how it happens for all of us. Through finding each other, we find ourselves. That's how it's always worked, all the way back to the Marquis de Sade's time, and beyond. It's just how human beings function. And your children are just as human as you are, just as human as I am, just as human as Sade was, just as human as the best and worst individuals our species has ever produced. 
To all the parents here today in 2023, especially the ones buying into this transphobic hysteria about groomers and predators, and especially those of you who don't think your teenage children are questioning or experimenting with their gender or sexuality, because I assure you, they are, and if you don't know that, that means they don't trust you, and they're right not to. In five to ten years from now, these politicians and pundits will still be pushing this anti-trans legislation and rhetoric, and by then, it'll be your grown-up children being targeted and condemned as the groomers and predators who are corrupting the youth. Well. That is, if your kids are even allowed to grow up, assuming they don't kill themselves, believing that they will never be truly loved and accepted for who they are. Mm, it's true, but he shouldn't say it. My words are harsh, I know, but they come from years of being condemned and mistreated by an even harsher society. And it's the same with Saw's cruel philosophy. It was cultivated by a sensitive, queer person condemned and mistreated by his even crueler society. And like me, Saad says, fuck morality. Morality is only ever a weapon of control wielded by those with power to inflict pain and suffering upon the powerless. Morality means nothing to those who use it to oppress others. So what does it mean to be a libertine? Well, like morality, it means nothing if divorced from the much more important and tangible matter of power. For the wealthy and powerful libertines in the 120 days of Sodom, rejection of morality and convention means embracing the implacable desire to dehumanize and rape and slaughter. But for this loud-mouthed and relatively powerless 21st century trans woman, being a libertine and rejecting conventional morality means being able to embrace my rather easily satisfied desire to be as feminine as I want and have consensual gay sex without being condemned as a degenerate, depraved predator. Now. What about the Marquis de Sade himself? What kind of libertine was he? Or, more relevantly, where did Sade and his pursuit of pleasures stand in relation to power? Circle 5. Libertine Dementia, or Crimes versus Punishments. I am a libertine, but I am neither a criminal nor a murderer. I am a libertine, but three families residing in your area have for five years lived off my charity and I have saved them from the farthest depths of poverty. I am a libertine, but I have saved a deserter from death, a deserter abandoned by his entire regiment and by his colonel. I am a libertine, but at Ivry, with your whole family looking on, I saved a child, at the risk of my own life, who was on the verge of being crushed beneath the wheels of a runaway horse-drawn cart by snatching the child from beneath it. I am a libertine, but I have never compromised my wife's health, nor have I been guilty of the other kinds of libertinage so often fatal to children's fortunes. In a word, did I in my youth herald a heart capable of the atrocities of which I today stand accused? How therefore do you presume that, from so innocent a childhood and youth, I have suddenly arrived at the ultimate of premeditated horror? No, you do not believe it. Your vengeance has beguiled your mind. You have proceeded blindly to tyrannize. But your heart knows mine. It judges more fairly. And it knows full well it is innocent. So as far as Saad's actual crimes go, well, it's complicated. This part's going to be tricky to parse, and we'll have to remember to keep in mind nuance, historical context, and the biases of the deeply puritanical and queerphobic system of power governing French society in the 1700s. I'm not implying that the Marquis de Sade was blameless or a saint. He was complicated, flawed, and imperfect. And despite how he's been mythologized by his most fanatic followers, there's nothing divine about our Marquis. He was no more or less human than you and I. And honestly, given how virulently anti-religious Saad was, I strongly believe that he would be disappointed, if not outright disgusted, that so many of his fans in the 20th and 21st centuries regarded him as the Divine Marquis. You know, kind of like how Jesus would be repulsed by the way Christians deify and worship him today. Food for thought. Dying at 74 years old after spending roughly 32 of them incarcerated, he lived a long and difficult life. His hardships enabled him to grow and change, and he stands in stark contrast to the most heinous criminals in his social class, in that, disproportionately severe as they might have been, Saad experienced consequences for his wrongdoings. So please don't think I'm here to defend sexual violence or condone child abuse. I'm absolutely not. But the fact is that Saad was living in a time when queerness was egregiously demonized, when the truth was easily distorted and manipulated by those in power in order to unjustly persecute queer people. And in fact, the most questionable aspects of the charges levied against Saad directly pertain to his queerness, rather than anything most of us would morally condemn today. The vast majority of Saad's sexual infamy, the acts which earned him the reputation of a libertine, consisted of hiring sex workers, both women and men, and having orgies with them at his home in Lacoste. Scandalous, yeah, but if we're thinking beings and not Puritans, we have no place judging Saad for paying for the services of sex workers. In 1763, at the age of 23, Saad hired a local Parisian sex worker named Jean Testard. His behavior with her included requests for sodomy, 
anal sex, which were allegedly refused, and participating in various blasphemies. He asked her if she believed in God, and when she said yes, he shouted obscenities about Jesus and the Virgin Mary and insisted there was no God. He then allegedly masturbated into a church chalice, stomped on a crucifix while masturbating with another, ordered Testar to verbally degrade him and beat him with a cane whip and an iron whip heated by fire, and recited blasphemous poems over the 12-hour or ordeal. <laughs> Oh, sorry. When Testard reported Saad to the authorities afterwards, he was arrested and charged with outrage to public morals, blasphemy, and the profanation of the image of Christ. In the years following, Saad was put under the surveillance of the police, who made detailed reports on his subsequent activities. Allegedly. Like, I've done a fuckload of research into this guy and his life, and I must say, one thing the authorities consistently lack is actual details of misconduct. Strange. And the chief police inspector even advised madams of local brothels to refuse Saad's business. On Easter Sunday of 1768, when Saad was 27, he hired Rose Keller, a 36-year-old German widow who had been reduced into begging for alms to survive, allegedly for house cleaning services. Although Saad afterward testified that his activities with Keller were prearranged and she knew what would be expected of her. So he kept Rose Keller locked in his country house in Paris suburb Arquil, during which time he flagellated her with a whip, which he did admit to in court, and cutting her on her back, butt, and thighs, and pouring hot wax into the wounds, which Keller failed to produce evidence for. She escaped after two days and reported Saad to the locals and the authorities. He was imprisoned again, but was exiled to Lacoste under house arrest after Keller was bribed to drop charges. And then, in the summer of 1772, when Saad was 32 years old, he and his manservant Latour were staying in Marseille, and hired five sex workers between the ages of 18 and 23. Marianne Laverne, Marionette Logier, Rose Coste, Mariette Borelli, and Marguerite Coste. During the subsequent orgy, Saad whipped the girls and requested they do the same to him, and he had anal sex with them, including engaging in mutual sodomy with his boyfriend. Finally, he gave the women chocolates laced with aphrodisiacs, two of whom got sick afterwards, prompting them to report Saad to the authorities for sodomy and attempted poisoning. This incident, called the Marseille Affair, is the most clear-cut and well-documented of Saad's sex crimes, and even it is riddled with ambiguity and questionable factors. Firstly, the physician's examination concluded that there was no poison in the aphrodisiacs, they were just poorly mixed aniseed, welcome to the 1700s, and all the women subsequently dropped charges of attempted poisoning, something that was ignored by the prosecutor. Secondly, the main accusation of sodomy, i.e. the women reported Saad fucking and getting fucked by his boyfriend, manservant. This was the principal charge leveled against Saad and Latour, along with the debunked attempted poisoning, as well as the nebulous outrage to the country's morals. And it's for this offense that they were sentenced to death. For the said sod to be decapitated and the said Latour to be hanged by the neck and strangled, then the bodies be burned and their ashes strewn to the wind. Sod and Latour fled to Italy and were executed in effigy for sodomy. Also worth noting, the presiding judge who continued Sod's case despite the sex workers withdrawing their accusations of poisoning and sentenced them to death was both an enemy of Sod's father-in-law and also the presiding judge in the Rose Keller case. Make of that what you will. Saad spent the next few years on the run and in hiding from 1774 to 1777 between Italy and his Lacoste castle, where he reunited with his wife, a rather interesting figure herself, but we'll get to her eventually, and resumed his strange orgies with the young men and women he and his wife had hired as valets, chambermaids, secretary, cook, etc. These orgies took the form of theatrical sexual performances, and admittedly, the, the participants were allegedly teenagers, which isn't great. Problem. I'm not comfortable with it personally, but I can also acknowledge that my moral judgment, let's call it what it is, it's thoroughly a moral judgment, comes from the 21st century, post-industrial revolution, where adolescence is legally and societally recognized as a thing that exists. Remember, this was pre-revolution France, back when you were considered an adult once you were capable of working, which turns out is pretty fucking young, as the countless companies exploiting child labor across the globe today can attest to. And let's be real, okay? Children were essentially legally recognized as the property of their parents. Women were considered nothing more than breeding stock, and therefore were regarded as adults as soon as they were capable of bearing children, which, even today, is something that happens pretty fucking early. No, I'm not condoning fucking minors, okay? I'm just saying that a lot of us, even if we've been understanding of the nuances of Saad's indiscretions before this, will consider the youth of the servants he employed for these sadomasochistic orgies as a blanket justification for society's condemnation of him as a monster, and leave it at that. I'm here to call that out for the sanctimonious hypocrisy it is, because Saad was not some kind of anomaly for this. In the so-called Age of Enlightenment in Europe, the sexual exploitation of children was the norm, not an abnormal exception. And honestly, if we're keeping it real, the case can be made that while our society is theoretically better on paper in the present day, the sexual exploitation and abuse of children is still the cultural norm. So quit clutching your fucking pearls and relax. 
Remember, when we're considering cases of exploitation and violence, morality is irrelevant next to the matter of power. And this is how Saw differed from the libertines in his novels. He didn't kidnap anyone. He hired them, just like he had previously hired sex workers. And when they didn't want to participate anymore, you know what they did? They fucking left. They quit and returned home. In the solitude of the Chateau of Le Coste, he set up for himself a harem, submissive to his whims. But Le Coste was not the inaccessible fortress of the 120 days of Sodom. It was surrounded by society. Only René Pelagie conformed to the character assigned to her by her husband. All the others claimed the right to live their own lives. And Saad was once again made to understand that he could not turn the real world of hard fact into a theater. And of the legal accusations against Saad that came out of this, it's not insignificant to point out that none of them came from the actual employees themselves, but from their indignant parents. You know, parents who felt that their property had been stolen from them. And as far as the legal system went, they didn't give a fuck about these young people so much as they just wanted to nail Saad to a prison wall for the rest of his life for the heinous and unforgivable crime of homosexual buttfuckery. Editing Vivian here. I thought it would be a good idea to circle back to this and provide some actual numbers and cases for historical context to shut down the bad faithers who will try to say I'm a pedophile apologist or whatever. Now, I want to keep this part as minimal as possible, no illustrative visuals or anything, but still this brief interlude involves the discussion of historical attitudes towards sexual intercourse involving what are legally defined today as minors. And because the past was super fucked up, there are some disturbingly low numbers here. And if this is something you don't want to subject yourself to, you can skip ahead to 14641. Now, age of consent laws did indeed exist in Europe in the 1700s. The information I found comes from English law in the 1700s, but they should give you all an idea of the general perception of young people's sexuality during the so-called age of enlightenment. This comes from A History of Homoerotica by queer historian Richter Norton. The age of consent for girls with regard to sexual intercourse was 10. That is, sex with girls below the age of 10 was automatically classified as rape, because girls below the age of 10 were deemed to be legally incapable of consent. The age of consent for girls with regard to marriage was 12. That is, a girl under the age of 12 could not lawfully consent to marriage. The age of consent for boys was 14. Specifically, it was not lawful for boys below the age of 14 to get married, and boys below the age of 14 could not be prosecuted for sodomy or rape. For an adult, sodomy was illegal in all cases, regardless of the age of the partner and regardless of the consent of the partner. That is, it is not possible to have an age of consent for homosexual relations. Now, the age of consent for girls was designed to protect girls from sexual molestation or exploitation, but the age of consent for boys was designed to protect boys from sexual prosecution, not to protect them from sexual molestation. There aren't really any cases involving heterosexual molestation, i.e. the rape of boys by women, which was not deemed to be conceivable, and the law against buggery already protected them against male sexual molestation. The age of consent essentially constitutes the age of legal liability. Modern historians and sex law reformers usually anachronistically use the concept in the context of the legal liability of the older person rather than the legal liability of the younger person whose age is being considered. Certainly within the field of homosexual relations, today the age of consent is used to determine whether or not the older partner can be prosecuted, whereas in the past it was used solely to determine whether or not the younger partner could be prosecuted. I won't go into specific legal cases, although there are plenty. Um, my sources in the bibliography, um, if you're interested in that, you can check it out. But generally, even given these laws, more often than not, offenders were acquitted for the rape of girls as young as 10. According to Antony E. Simpson's Sexual Underworlds of the Enlightenment, from 1730 to 1830, there were 294 prosecutions for heterosexual rape in the Old Bailey. Only 51 of these cases, that's 17%, received a guilty verdict, and 28 offenders were executed. 57 cases involved girls under 10 years old, and only 10 of these offenders were found guilty. Yeah, this is fucked up. I know. And these cases don't make Saad's actions acceptable. Not at all. But they do put things into historical perspective. The truth is, society did not give a fuck about children in the 18th century, and modern-day moralistic finger-wagging and condemnation of the Marquis de Sade is anachronistic at best. To reiterate, while it doesn't make Sade's hiring of young teenagers acceptable, in the context of his time, 14- to 16-year-olds were adults in the eyes of the law. Feel what you want to feel about it, think whatever you want to think, make of all this what you will. This is just to keep you more fully informed of the way things were in the past, because yeah, the past was fucking awful. And this whole giving a shit about children thing we got going on in the 21st century is a relatively new thing. It's a good thing, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't always like this, and we need to keep that in mind.
But in 1777, at the age of 37, Saad was tricked by his mother-in-law into coming to Paris to visit his supposedly sick, but actually dead, mother, where he was arrested and imprisoned. He managed to successfully appeal his death sentence, you know, the one he was condemned to for having consensual gay sex, but he remained in prison under what was called the Lettre de Cachet, or letters signed by the King of France and closed with the royal seal. See, Lettres de Cachet were usually used to enforce arbitrary judgments that could not be appealed, wherein a subject is imprisoned without trial or opportunity of defense. These were mainly used against drunkards, troublemakers, prostitutes, squanders of the family fortune, insane persons, to dispose of inconvenient individuals, especially to prevent unequal marriages between commoners and nobility, or to prevent a scandal. You know, king shit. That sort of abuse of power that got them guillotined. So, make of all that what you will. Saad remained in prison from 1777 to 1790, during the French Revolution, and evidently his time in prison got to him, along with the bloodiness of the revolution himself, as he spent the rest of his life not committing and being accused of sex crimes. Saad's sexuality was not stilled by age and fatigue alone. The guillotine killed the morbid poetry of eroticism. In order to derive pleasure from the humiliation and exaltation of the flesh, one must first describe value to the flesh. It has no sense, no worth, once one casually begins to treat man as a thing. Instead, the former Marquis would only come into conflict with the authorities over his extreme far-left political beliefs, including, strangely, his more humanistic inclinations as they stood in contention with the bloodthirsty revolutionaries. And, of course, his sexually transgressive and explicit writings, which would, ironically, get him imprisoned without trial for over a decade once a new tyrant took over. Okay, there you have it. The Marquis' crimes and their punishments. Judge if you must, but admit that at least he was never punished out of consideration for the well-being of the disadvantaged people he allegedly harmed, but out of commitment to a rigidly enforced system of morality whose deepest grudge against Saad was that he dared to have queer sex and thus offend the angry puritanical god they fetishized, that blue-balled anti-masturbator and great all-loving faggot hater. His chief interest for us lies not in his aberrations, but in the manner in which he assumed responsibility for them. He made of his sexuality an ethic. He expressed this ethic in works of literature. It is by this deliberate act that Saad attains a real originality. And so Saad's freedom was stripped from him. He was caged, separated from the outside world, for over a decade. And a very, very eventful decade at that. And while I've never been incarcerated myself, I know enough about it to know that incarceration is one of the worst, most traumatizing experiences a human being can endure. Being able to participate in society at all is one of the most overlooked privileges we have. Because as members of society, we are allowed the means to maintain the delusion that we are free beings with agency and self-determination. But in prison, you are a slave and you're not given any delusion to the contrary. And if you're incarcerated in the US, you are literally a slave. Incarceration is deeply traumatic and devastating. It fucks people up, changes them, and generally not for the better. Saad came out of prison a different person than the libertine twink he was when he entered, but he did not exit alone. He brought with him the dangerous ideas, fantasies, and philosophies that materialized in the darkness of his containment, what he would leave the world and the society that reviled him. Saad began writing in prison to cope. And through writing, he learned about himself and humankind. And out of isolation, just like I had done with him, Saad found someone. Someone through whom he could reveal and wield the terrifying truth she helped him discover. A part of him that emerged only after he'd been reduced to a hungry beast, powerlessly pacing in its cage. His savior? A twelve-year-old girl named Justine. And the truth she delivered? Porque si. Allá. La gente. 
gente generalmente se detiene ante ciertos pensamientos. Su vida es una continua distracción de su propia perversión. Cuando piensas en cogerte a tu mamá, rápidamente buscas distraer a tu mente de esos pensamientos. La soledad, en cambio, te arrastra y te hace enfrentar tus chaquetas más oscuras. Y no pasa nada. Dejas de tener miedo de tus pensamientos más grotescos. Tenemos la carne, or We Are the Flesh, is a 2016 Mexican-French film debut feature of Emiliano Rochaminter. It's, uh, as a movie, kind of batshit insane. Set in this strange post-apocalyptic underground shelter, Lucio and Fauna, a brother and sister, meet the cave's resident, simultaneously unnervingly creepy and irresistibly charismatic Mariano. Vuelta por la ciudad como mayates. No tenemos a dónde ir. Podemos hacer alguna clase de trato. He offers to feed and shelter them, but for a cost. They have to sleep under lock and key, eat the abominable, rancid food he makes, and, most gruelingly, work all day to help barricade and reinforce his strange cocoon shelter. Oh, and he makes them fuck, too. Es mi hermana. Verga que tienes ahí pegada. Ese pedazo de carne que se hincha y se levanta como una víbora, le importa que sea tu hermana. Now, I'd say that's a spoiler, but that's only the beginning, and honestly, it's one of the less shocking things to happen in this movie. In just 79 minutes, there's incest, rape, murder, cannibalism, unsimulated sex and masturbation, piss and menstrual blood, recurring eerie interpretive dance, wall-to-wall -wall phallic and yonic imagery, psychedelic-fueled visuals and orgies, and even a brief dash of necrophilia. It's, unironically, a great movie. A very... Very beautiful film, notwithstanding. It has many, many interesting things to discuss and explore, and the way it does so is extreme, but not inaccessible. And most importantly, in my opinion, We Are the Flesh is one of the best cinematic explorations of Sadean philosophy, more so even than any direct adaptations of Saad's novels. Because Mariano truly understands Saad, more than any of the pontificating rich scoundrels traditionally wielding the Marquis' words in lesser fiction. Por dinero. No te vamos a matar por una ideología. Ni por el placer de verte sufrir. Ninguna clase de venganza por todas las cosas jodidas que has hecho. No somos castigadores ni verdugos. Te vamos a matar por tu sangre. Por tu carne. Ni por una serie de exquisitas sustancias que lo recorren. Te agarramos a ti por azar. Y recuerda que el azar es el criminal más grande que ha pisado la tierra. He is a filthy, feral creature, manically philosophizing while permatripping on an unknown, unspecified drug. In order to survive, these desperate siblings must submit to this strange, horny little trickster god to learn the truth that his companion, Solitude, taught him. It's a truth we can only discover by stripping away every pretension and artifice of this thing we call society, and considering ourselves for what we actually are, on the most material and practical dimension of human existence. Are you ready? This is something you can't unhear or unlearn. At the end of the day, we are animals. No different or more special than any other beast beyond our own existential narcissism. We're mannequins made of meat, bodies animated by impulse and desire. We are just flesh. Flesh that yearns solely to touch and taste the flesh of others. The human condition is savagery. And the belief that any of us could possibly be otherwise is a narcissistic delusion. The cancerous idea this entire thing we call civilization is built upon. And unraveling and demystifying this myth is the ultimate philosophical triumph of the Marquis de Sade's work. It's the secret that solitude imparts. And now, more than ever, in the never-ending nightmare that is life in the 21st century, we need to listen to her and learn her secret. We need to talk about Justine.